Good morning, everybody. Sorry, we're from problems with the cameras today, so uh, you put, if you're online, you can probably hear us, but you can't see us, which may well be a good thing. Anyway, <laughs> let's come and worship our God today. Today we are looking at the I Am saying where Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life. And the psalmist says to the Lord, show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. And so we come to worship that God, to seek his path, to follow Jesus, who is the way. Let's worship Jesus. Firstly, singing from uh, Mission Praise, number 251. Remember, if you're here, you, you can't sing out loud. You're allowed to hum uh, behind your mask, but please don't sing. 251, how sweet the name of Jesus sounds. Let's still ourselves in the presence of God. Let's come and pray together. Let's pray. Lord God, we step again into your presence, into the presence of the holy God, the God who sits on his throne in glory and is worshipped and honoured by all. Lord Jesus, we gaze upon you as you sit at the right hand of your Father. We gaze upon the beauty of your face. We rejoice in your perfect humanity and your wonderful divinity. For you, Jesus, are fully God and fully man. As fully human, Lord Jesus, we worship you, the one who never sinned, the one who lived the perfect human life, the life that demonstrated the love of your Father. We worship you because as divine, you are God. You and the Father are one. You are the way to the Father. You show the way. We worship you because you as div divine stepped into the mess of our world as a human being. You stepped into the mess of this world to die for our sin. To take away the separation between us and your Father. And so Lord Jesus, as we gaze upon your beauty... We know that that beauty was seen in the ugliness of the cross. That that beauty is most seen in the ugliness of taking our sin. And so we rejoice that because you, God and man, died for that sin, that we are raised. That we are given a beauty, your beauty, way beyond that which we deserve. That you take our dirty rags and you give us your cloak of righteousness. 
You raise us to that place of adoption as daughters and sons of the Father. And you bring us right into the Father's presence. And not only that, you send through your Father the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who lives with us and tells us and renews our faith and shows us that you are always with us. And so Holy Spirit, as we seek more of you today, we ask that you would show us more and more of Jesus. And therefore, more and more of the Father and his love for all of us. Hear our praises, Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, for we pray in Jesus' name. And hear us now as we join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Apologies, I meant to say we're allowed to say the Lord's Prayer quietly. Apparently the rules have changed, but I forgot to say that before. From next week, Do say the Lord's Prayer when we get to that bit in our first prayer. Now, because we have no video, we don't have any kids, so we don't have Zach, so I'm really sorry, mate, so you can sit there and relax and enjoy this. Let's cut to our reading. Again, I don't know what happened to the reading this week. We're going to read from John chapter 14, from verse 1 down to verse 14. So let's hear uh, God's word together. Jesus is talking to his disciples. He has just told them again that he is going to die on the cross. And the disciples are upset, naturally, of course. So Jesus reassures them with this sixth I am. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe in the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to ask the Father. I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. 
Amen. Jesus comforts his disciples with his amazing words about heaven and about the way to heaven. Him being the way, the truth, and the life. Now we'll reflect on those words in a moment or two, but before we do that, let's uh, reflect again on another words of another hymn. It's from the praise hymn book, uh, Shine Now Upon Us, Lord. Thanks, Mike. See if this works. No, John, can you move it on? I think that's me now. So, we've used an image like this before. Have you ever been lost? Lost somewhere where it's dark and you can't see where you're going? Or perhaps, as I've been many times in the scouts on the top of a hill and it's misty and you're just not sure where you are or where to go? Or maybe you're out driving and imagine, try and imagine days when we didn't have sat-navs and we didn't trust this wee device on our phone. Days when you're out in the middle of nowhere and you took a wrong turn and you're driving along the road and you literally don't know where you are. You're lost and you're anxiously looking for something, whether in the forest or on the hills or on the roads. You look for something familiar. Something that will suddenly help you understand where you are. A signpost, perhaps. Something that reorientates your uh, geography, reorientates your life, reorientates everything, because suddenly you have something that's familiar. Something that hasn't changed or moved because of the circumstances. Well, that's the kind of imagery that Jesus is dealing with today. As we look at the sixth I am statement of Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus gives his disciples something, a familiar signpost, which reorientates them in their confusion. He gives them himself as the signpost. 
And we see that in this sixth I am. We see that in all of these I ams. They're all about Jesus the person and Jesus the God. But as we say every time we're looking at one of these I am verses, the context is important. What comes round about that verse helps us understand what the verse is about and is vitally important. We don't just pluck verses out of Scripture. We look at the context round about it. And what Jesus says before and after this I am is really helpful and really helps us understand what he means in John 14, verse 6. At the beginning of the chapter, Jesus is comforting his disciples. As I said before, in chapter 13, this is part of the long discourse that Jesus has with his disciples, probably in the upper room, which John record, is, uh, records through the Holy Spirit. And Jesus has been telling them in chapter 13, again, that he is going to die. And then we had Peter uh, standing up and saying, no, 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 you're not going to die and all the rest of it. And Jesus has upset the disciples. He's told them again that he is going to die. And so they are confused. They are wandering in the darkness. They're in the mist. They'd suddenly their whole lives are facing uh, change. They've followed this guy about for three years. They've given up their jobs and some of them their families. And suddenly this guy is saying he is going to die. Now, it's not the first time he's told them. But the disciples are thick, just like me. And they don't understand. And so Jesus, is be at the beginning of chapter 14, wants to reassure them. So he says, verse 1, Do not let your hearts be troubled. This whole passage is about reassurance. But how does Jesus reassure them? He says, you believe in God, believe also in me. And then we hear these wonderful verses beginning at verse 2. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you. But I'm telling you, I'm going there. Remember, he's just told him he's going to die. So he's telling him, I'm going to my father's house to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. That you may also be where I am. Remember, he's just told them he is going to his death, that they will be separated from them. But now he is reassuring them, telling them that he is going to come back and take them to be with him. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. Now that's really important. We'll see that in a minute or two. How Jesus reassures them. He tells his disciples he's going to his father's house to prepare a place and he's going to come and take them. The reassurance of those words should flow over us today. We thought last time of Jesus saying he was the resurrection and the life. Here Jesus is expanding that, if you like, that what the resurrection will mean. That believers, even though they die, will go and be with Jesus and his Father in his Father's house. That he is going there to prepare a place for them and for you. A place prepared by Christ for you. Now, Alice tells me she works up in the hydro and she tells me that something like is it 60 people or 80 people are going to arrive at some point in the hydro. They have to get all the rooms ready. They have to get everything just right. They have to follow all the restrictions, of course. But they are preparing a place for someone to go and be so that they can charge them money, of course. But Jesus is going to heaven to prepare a place for believers. A place that is free, bought for you through his death. And not only that, he is going to come back and take you to be with him. 
It's like wandering across the hills in the mist, and suddenly the mist clears, and you suddenly are able to work out where you are and where to go. Or you're in the darkness in the forest, and suddenly there's a light. You see a road or something, and you suddenly are reorientated. You suddenly see, and all the fear and all the anxiety and all the worry goes. Or you're driving along, and you see the signpost that says Dumblain, 15 miles or whatever. And suddenly, you're reassured. Well, as we face the ultimate darkness, which we all face, death itself, here we have Jesus reassuring, telling his disciples and, the, and all believers what's going to happen. Now, the, the coming back so that I may take you to be where I am may refer to his resurrection on, the, on Easter Sunday, it may refer to the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, or it may refer to Jesus' actual return at the end of time. John doesn't elaborate, neither does Jesus. It's probably a mixture of all three. All three ease troubled minds. Remember, Jesus appeared to the disciples in the upper room on Easter Sunday. How reassuring must that have been as he came back to them after death? Then they have the reassurance of the Holy Spirit coming upon them, the Holy Spirit being the Spirit of Christ, God coming to live with them, and we'll see more of that in a minute or two. And then we also have that future promise of Jesus coming back at the end of time when our bodies will rise and we will be have that physical body, perfect body in heaven. But the, 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 the overall the uh, thing here is that Jesus is easing their troubled minds. Not to trust in their goodness or their deeds. Not to even trust in this image of walking up to pearly gates, thinking that we're going to encounter Peter, who's got some big book that records all of our good deeds and bad deeds. And hopefully, if our good deeds outweighs our bad deeds, or if we've been religious enough, that somehow he will let us in. No. Jesus is the way to heaven. That way is bought and given as a free gift through grace. Jesus is calling them to trust in him, even though he is about to depart. Bruce Milne in his commentary says, not to trust in our own goodness or deeds, but to trust in Jesus' goodness and Jesus' deeds. Remember, he is the resurrection and the life. So having reassured them about this place that he is going to, and it's a physical place, Jesus says, you know the way, the place to where I'm going. He finished by saying, you know this. They've been with him for three years. He's been teaching them for three years. Their whole lives have been intertwined with him over these three years. That's why the shock of his impending departure is so hard for them. But Jesus is saying, you know all this, I've been telling you. But Thomas... Thomas says, this seems to cause a degree of panic. Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? He blurts out an honest response. Lord, we don't know. And how many times have we been there in our lives, our walk with Christ? We just don't know, we don't understand. Bruce Milne says something which is quite helpful. He says, whilst we cannot be glad for the dullness of the disciple, who would have done any better, he says, we can be thankful that their questions then draw out an important response from Jesus. Can you see what Bruce Mullen is saying? The disciples don't get it. They're human beings just like you and I. Faced with death, we're totally confused. But because, they, because Thomas asked this dull, stupid question, if you like, Jesus then expands. And he expands in such a way that fills our lives with assurance and faith, that totally takes away any of our troubled minds. Because then Jesus says, I am the way. The reason they 
know the way or should know the way is because the way is standing right in front of them. So when Thomas says, show us the way, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Just as we heard R.C. Sproul say last week, Jesus doesn't just bring bread, he is the bread. Jesus doesn't just show us the gate or the door, Jesus is the door. Jesus doesn't bring light, he is the light. He is the resurrection and he is the way and the truth and the life. We saw with the sheepfold, I was being reminded by Moira, who's been watching our services for a, a number of months now, that you get these sheepfolds in the south of Scotland. I was claiming only the north of England, but you do get them in the south of Scotland, and no doubt the north of Scotland as well. But that image of the sheepfold, remember Jesus saying, I am the gate, the way in, the way out, the only way in to the, the sheepfold. Jesus is expanding in that. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, Jesus makes an exclusive claim here. No one comes to the Father except through me. A claim which jolts us in our pluralistic world and ever more, more pluralistic church. Jesus claims that not only is he the way, the truth, and the life, he claims that no one else comes to the Father except through me. Now, Peter will preach these words in Acts chapter 4 when he will say, salvation is found in no one else but Jesus Christ. The exclusiveness of this statement, says Bruce Mill, cannot be reduced. We may not like it. We may wish Jesus had never said it, but he did. And so we must deal with it. Why does Jesus say such a thing? that no one it can come to the Father except through him. Now, before we explore that question, let's just state that it doesn't mean that other religions are devoid of value or general revelation. Bruce Milne points us to Romans 2, go away and read it, tells us that people's conscience may speak to them and lead them to do things that God wants doesn't mean that we can't work together with other religions for the common good of humanity or even learn from each other's practice. But one thing we will learn when we dialogue with other religions is that they are different from Christianity. David Wenham in an article in the Gospel Coalition website says, Although humility and respect towards people of other faiths should characterize Christians, we should deal with other faiths with humility and respect. The notion that Christians recognize that other faiths are an alternative way to God cannot be accepted. Why is he saying that? Because Jesus says, no one come to the Father except through me. The key thing in another article in the Gospel Coalition website by a man called Colin Hansen, he says, is for us to communicate and display that gospel in our lives and point people to Christ in love. Remember, Jesus, this comes in the context of Jesus speaking reassurance to his disciples. This is not Jesus making some exclusive claim just for the sake of making an exclusive claim. So with that said, let's see why Jesus says that. Why can Jesus say such a thing? Why can Jesus say such an exclusive thing? Remember I said, context is vital. What comes next explains why Jesus can say he is the only way to the Father. Because look what he says. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Jesus is about to say something else, which is completely shocking. He has said it before. We've seen it already in these I am statements. He says he is God. 
And that upset the Pharisees and the Sadducees, didn't it? We saw that. They wanted to stone him because he said he was God. Well, Jesus is repeating that. Jesus is saying, I'm God. I and the Father are one. No one can come to the Father except through him because he is the Father. He is God. He is not just the path to God. He is God. He and the Father are one. He is unique. His claims are unique because he is unique. He is fully human, fully God. And him and the Father and the Spirit, as we'll see, are united. That's what we understand, the Trinity. And it's vitally important that you understand what Jesus is saying before you judge what he says in John 14, verse 6. He's not just a human being or a prophet or a religious leader teaching people. He is God himself. You can't come to God without coming to Christ because God and Christ cannot be separated. He is human, but he is fully divine. And that is a unique claim from Christ. Philip says, look, you've got, I mean, these disciples are brilliant. They are, they're, they're amazing. Because they don't get it, just as we don't get it. Philip says, you know, where has he been? He might, I don't know if he's just drifted out of the, of the conversation like, like we all do, and suddenly thinks, what? What did I miss? He said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us doesn't get it. Show us the Father. What Jesus just said, if you see me, you see the Father. Oh, show us the Father then. Jesus answers. And I think Jesus shows a bit of frustration. Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? He claims again, I and the Father are one. Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak in my own authority, rather it is the Father living in me who is doing this, his work. He is the way to the Father because he and the Father are one. There is no getting to the Father without going through Christ. So believe in me when I say I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe the evidence that I've shown you, the miracles, the walking in water, the calming of storms, the casting out of demons. These demonstrate that Jesus isn't just a human being. These demonstrate that Jesus is divine. And the ultimate demonstration of that, of course, will be when he dies on the cross and rises again, when the Father raises him from death. These demonstrate who Jesus is, God. So when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, he is saying that him and the Father are one. That's why he makes that exclusive claim, because he is God. The stress in this statement is way. I am the way. But don't forget what else he says. And the truth. And the life. Now, we've dealt with life a few times as we looked at these I am statements. Let's just focus for a second on that second part. I am the truth. Again, it's not just, I'm telling you the truth, it's I am the truth. Remember, this is all part of the reassurance, do not let your hearts be troubled. Jesus says to his disciples, I am the truth. Reassuring for the disciples, because he's, tell, he's saying to them, I'm, I'm, not, I'm telling you the truth, this is true what I am saying. His words can be trusted. He can be trusted. He is God, and as God, he knows what is true. He knows what is right, and he shows what is true through his life and through his teaching. 
Why is that reassurance? Well, we're back to this being lost on the hills or in a dark place or lost in a road. We are told in this world that there is no longer any objective truth, that everything is relative, that my truth is as valid as your truth, even when both of our truths are completely different and contradict each other. If there is no objective truth, then we're wandering about in the darkness. We're wandering about in the mist. We're driving about without any signposts because there's no right way, wrong way. There's no up, there's no down, there's no left, there's no right. We need objective truth in our lives so that we can orientate ourselves. We need a signpost which doesn't move, that points to Ashfield in that case, so that you know where Ashfield is. We need to know what is right and wrong, because otherwise it's anarchy. There is objective truth in the world. The problem is people think their truth is the only truth. But Jesus says, I am the truth. I am the one who shows up, down, left, right. I am the one who speaks truth. And that's so comforting for us in this mess of this world because suddenly we have something which orientates us. R.C. Sproul says this in his wee book about the I am. He says, he takes great comfort in the knowledge that virtually every principle in the Bible, everything that the, teach, the Bible teaches is denied somewhere in our culture. He takes great comfort in that. How do you know what is true, he says? We go to the source of truth. The one who says he is the truth. The one who created the world. The one who was there when the world was formed. The one for whom the world was made. Jesus saying he is the truth. Is reassuring. Do not let your hearts be troubled because suddenly the disciples know what everything is about. Suddenly they have a way to navigate themselves through this life and into the next life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He isn't just an add on to our lives, someone to fit into a few minutes each day or into an hour on a Sunday. Jesus is the life. This verse shows us that we are called into a relationship with God, with Jesus. A relationship that we have been created for. Jesus is the way into that relationship. Jesus is the truth and we can trust what he says. And Jesus is the life and so we can follow him and know life in all of its fullness here and later in heaven. Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. And just in closing, we've talked about the Father, we've talked about the Son, and just to reassure them even further, and just to reassure you and I even further, what Jesus says next in verse 16, which we haven't read, so let's read it now. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Jesus has said, I'm going back to the Father. The disciples get uh, upset and anxious. Jesus says, do not let your heart be troubled. I, I am the way, the truth and the life. But I'm also sending the Holy Spirit to be with you, to live with you, so that you are not an orphan. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, coming to live in the life of believers, to complete the reassurance, to take away any troubled minds. 
This passage is beautifully full of the Trinity, who are three but one. This is life. Jesus calls us to this life through him, to know the Father, to know truth, to know life in this world, to know life in the next world. Therefore, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me, says Jesus. If you feel today that you're somehow lost in the dark or in the midst on the top of, the top of a hill, if you feel as if you're wandering along a road which is unfamiliar, you've taken a wrong turn somewhere, then turn round and see Jesus standing. The one who says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And through him, let all your troubled minds be eased. Let his promises roll over you. Meditate on what Jesus says. And live that life with him daily through the Holy Spirit, who is with you. And nothing can snatch you from the Father's hand. Why? Because Jesus is who he says he is. Amen. Let's reflect further by firstly having our organ recital, and then we'll pray to God. Now, as we come to pray for each other and the world, we, we want to pray for the family of Ian Houliston, one of our faithful elders. Ian passed away last week, and his family are having a private funeral on Wednesday. So we do pray for Sheena and the rest of the family. So let's come and bring our prayers to, to Jesus. Let's come and be reassured by Christ as we gather around him in prayer. Lord Jesus, we gather around you like those disciples on that Thursday evening. That evening when you said so much and when your disciples like us are so easily confused, so easily we misunderstand or just don't get it. Lord, maybe we've been hearing your words for years and the truth hasn't dawned on us what it actually means. Or maybe we're still asking questions and struggling with what you say. 
but we thank you that you said to them, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and also in me. And so, Lord, we gather around you with all of our questions, all of our stupid statements, all of our misunderstandings, and we gaze upon you the way, the truth, and the life. We thank you that you came to reassure, that you came to open the way to your Father, that all who believe in you would then be with him. We thank you for these great promises of you going to prepare a place A place prepared for us by you. And we thank you that you promised to come and take us there. Lord, for now we see in a mirror darkly. For now we are wandering about in a dark forest. For now we are trapped in the midst. For now we are so often lost. We thank you that you speak through the darkness, through the mist and through the lostness. You speak words of truth and you show yourself and you reorientate us and you guide us in life and also in death. Lord, today we trust you. We take you at your word. We see the evidence of the miracles and of your resurrection. And we know that what you say is true, that who you say you am, who you say you are, is real, that you're God and you're also one of us. We thank you that you send the Holy Spirit, that you, Holy Spirit, live in us daily. Holy Spirit, come and bring that reassurance daily to our lives. Come and guide us, teach us, help us, show us Jesus, make us more like Jesus. Help us to deal with the truth that he speaks to apply that truth to our lives and to reflect that truth with love and compassion into this world which is so lost. Lord, we do thank you for the reassurance of these words, especially to any here who are grieving or still living with bereavement or those grieving from this week. And we do pray for the family of Ian, our dear elder. Lord, be with Sheena, Finlay, Laura and their families as they grieve the loss of their father and husband. Be with them, reassure them with the same words that you reassured your disciples with. Stand amongst them, Lord, in your risen power. And may that risen power, Lord, flow through all of our lives, flow through, flow through our church and our world, drawing people to yourself, Lord Jesus, and showing the way and the life. And Lord, as we respond today and this week with our lives and our prayers and with our offerings given in the plate here or through uh, accounts, we ask, Lord Jesus, that these offerings would be used to bring reassurance and to ease troubled minds so that you will be glorified, so that the Father will be glorified through all that we do here in St. Blaine's. For we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's close singing uh, number, Mission Praise number 1024. All, it's a Stuart Town End song, All My Days.
So now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen.